The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by Continental Energy Solutions. I'm Tim Montague, your co-host. Today on the Clean Power Hour, corporates are going solar, but we have to do hourly energy tracking. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And robotic electric ships are taking over cargo shipping. It's cool. Used solar panels are powering the developing world. This is a wonderful thing. And the U.S. moves towards 45% emissions reductions by 2030. Welcome to the show, my co-host and commercial solar guy, John Weaver. Hello, Tim. How do you do? Hope all is well. I'm going to kind of poke and prod you and see if you've heard much about the reconciliation bill on your side, because it's kind of the thing that's been sticking in my head a whole bunch. There was a big vote. Uh, if you or any of our listeners have any comments, thoughts, insider knowledge, we would love some feedback because because uh, it's pretty big. Uh, so. Three and a half trillion dollars big. It's yeah, it's a big, big bill. And it's good for the clean energy transition. It's good for job creation. It's good for economic growth. It's good for, you know, electrification of transportation. So many, so many things. And, um, and I think that even Joe Manchin, who's, who's one of the problematic uh, Democrats, will eventually come along. So uh, because he realizes that West Virginia needs this. And coal is, coal is not coming back, people. That's just the economics of coal are, are broken. Natural gas kicked its butt first. And now solar, wind, and storage are kicking natural gas's butt. I think Manchin was bought off along with the uh, senator from Arizona in the infrastructure bill uh, to support the reconciliation bill. So hypothetically, I think the reconciliation bill will move forward. Um, the key piece that I was bringing up, there's two pieces actually. There's a tax credit uh, uh, similar to our ITC. Uh, it might be uh, the ITC might be extended for 10 years, increased back to 30%, and turned into a direct pay option. Uh, are you familiar with the direct pay structure? Yeah, we yeah. talked about direct pay last week. Okay, good. And, and, and um, it is an amazing thing, right? So even if you don't have a tax liability, which, of course, for example, nonprofits don't have, you can benefit from this ITC which is currently 26%, it's going to be stepped up to 30% as part of this package, I believe, right? Yep, yep. Yeah. And, ex and extended through what year? Uh, 10 years uh, from, yeah. I, 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 there's a lot of laws about how reconciliation works and I, I don't fully know it because I'm not a US Senator yet, um, but uh, the, uh, it can only go for 10 years and I think it goes, starts in 2022. So I guess that might mean it can go until the end of 2031. But so far, I've been saying the end of 2029 because I read that at some point. So 10, 10 years, though, is the explicit value I've been hearing. So I'm going to say through the end of 2031 is when the extension would be. And direct pay would be huge, very big. When I look at this graph, which you which you've uh, kindly gave us from Twitter, the one thing that rubs me a little bit is the rural co-op clean energy support at 3%. You know, the, the, the co-ops and munis are, are half of the United States. Now, they're not half of the population, but it's a huge geography. And I think that uh, we, we need to encourage more in the rural communities, but that's just, that's just me. What do you what do you uh, like and dislike about the, the the spread here? Well, the thing that matters most to me that I just paid attention to is the big chunk, the forty one point nine percent, because that includes the two big programs that matter in my in my industry for my work, and the clean yeah. energy payment program. That's where utilities will be given some sort of payment structure for ten years to increase their clean energy procurement. And then the clean energy tax incentives, that's specifically for um, uh, our direct pay option. Now, there's also two items in there that matter. One is the solar manufacturing tax credit, 
And then the other is the electric car tax credit. And those two things, of course, will matter you. So clean vehicle incentives and then the manufacturing. Now, the manufacturing uh, we've talked about, that might be included in the clean energy tax incentives. This was a very high level document put out by Schumer. He's the head of the Senate right now. And uh, so we got to, you know, over the next few weeks, we're going to see this come out, uh, this bill. And I believe by mid-September, per what I've read, we should see it come to the floor. So in the next three weeks, we should see explicit language that we can talk about and say, okay, it's no longer speculation based on this and that, and this and that. It's, it's real, it's hard, and it's coming now. The other criticism I've heard is on, on the electric vehicle incentives is that they've, they've capped the, the value of the vehicles. Is that right? So that many of the existing uh, EVs on the market are going to be excluded? It, it wasn't capped officially. So here's what occurred. When the Senate said, here's what we think we will support, and they put a document forward to the uh, um, to the House, they said, hey, here's some ideas from the Senate. We think we want to cap the clean energy. And uh, we think we want to cap it. And we also want to make sure that nothing from China gets a tax credit. So hypothetically, there's a cap on the price of the EVs and no solar panels coming from China. Now, whether or not that gets through the reconciliation with the House and gets put forward is a whole nother question. Um, so we just got to watch. We got to see what's going to come. This is the sausage making of the politics of how it comes forward. And, yeah. um, and so right now, the Senate, though, is not binding. The Senate doesn't make the law. The Senate has to push back and argue with the House. The House makes the rules. The Senate approves it, refines it, pushes back to the House, and there's going to be a dance. So officially, there is no cap yet. There is no limitation on where the panels can come from yet. That stuff could come. It could be part of the process. We just have to watch and, you know, cross fingers. Yeah, there's a lot of horse trading going on among the Democrats. Uh, and I, yeah, I just, I just want to get this done. But anyway, this, this vote that happened was, was a good thing, basically. So yes. it's, it's nudging it forward. Yep, yep, yep. Let's move on. <clears throat> I want to talk about, uh, well, let's talk about robot ships. This is robot. a cool story that uh, I'm going to put a CNET story, but there, this story got covered widely. Totally electric cargo ship sails silently and autonomously. The Yara Birkeland is the result of four years of development. So, you know, I, I didn't expect to see a cargo ship of this size. I mean, obviously they come in bigger sizes than this ship that you see here on screen but this is not a small ship and it's 100 percent electric uh and nicely painted zero emission right there on the side so i'm not sure what the range of the vehicle is uh on board the ship is seven megawatt hours worth of energy from batteries which gives the ship a top speed of 13 knots or 15 miles an hour and it can carry 103 containers so, you know, this, I'm sure there are container ships that carry 10 times that probably, <laughs> but. Yeah. Yeah. And th this ship is for moving around Norway so that they can move things in their area. So this is not a long distance. This is not an ocean going ship. Uh, well, it may go into the ocean, but it's not a big, it's not crossing the Pacific. That's not its job. This is for local moving yeah. around of things. And uh it's Those cool. Norwegians, they're crafty. They, they really like electrification for some reason. Um, and I mean, they already get most of their electricity from hydropower in Norway. They have tremendous hydro resources. And of course, now they're going after the wind industry, most of which they will export to uh, other parts of Northern Europe. And as we've, well, dis as we've discussed, the, the question is, how does Norway stop pumping oil out of the ground? They're not going to stop. They're not going to stop until we stop using it because they're going to use their money to fund the green transition. And to be blunt, I'd rather Norway pump it than uh, Russia, Saudi Arabia, because Russia's building guns, Saudi Arabia's building palaces. 
Norway's building wind farms and EVs and hydro and electric cargo ships. So I don't want them to stop yet. I want them to keep working at it. Yeah, I guess that's point well taken. <clears throat> Could be worse. Um, let's talk about the Canary Media story that Jeff St. John brought us. Companies and cities are taking the lead in the clean energy purchase. When will market rules catch up? And I mean, some of the statistics that Jeff St. John cites here are really incredible. You know, companies like Google and Microsoft are going after not only offsetting 100% of their load, but offsetting their load in real time. And that's the, that's the trick or the tricky part is that we don't currently have a tracking infrastructure that allows these corporates to track that uh, information on a, on a market, so to speak. And so Jeff, Rep, Jeff um, highlights a organization called Energy Tag, which is based in the UK, which is creating this. And I'll put Energy Tag on screen here in a second. Um, you know, today, my understanding is that the rec market is mostly a monthly tracking mechanism, right? Here in Illinois, certainly, that's the requirement for reporting RECs. And there's organizations like PJM GATS, where you're reporting your energy production from your renewable energy facility on a monthly basis. And what we just need to do is just see this infrastructure as information and, and just start tracking it in real time. They're all connected to computers and the internet, right? So why not? The real time, you know, there's a lot of greenwashing that goes on still on the corporate level where they're like, ah, we're 100% clean powered. No, you're not. You just, you, you funded, partially funded a solar power or wind project somewhere else. And it's uh, pumping an equivalent amount of electricity into the grid as you, da, 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 da. And you and I both know how that game works. And all of our listeners, you know, they're dealing with PPAs. And, so these groups aren't 100% green powered. What they are doing is funding green power, which is very valuable. Google was the first to really come forward and say, listen, we need to shape our use, our clean energy generation to be equivalent to our, clean, our energy usage. And this is going to take time. This is, uh, this is the next stage of it. And it's going to start slowly and it's going to keep building. One thing that will allow this to occur is when we have big grids with solar and storage on them and batteries. Because the solar, you know, you can guarantee that you're clean powered from 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. That's cool. In Texas, you can mostly guarantee from 6 p.m. until midnight, 4 a.m. with the wind. That's cool. Now we got to mix them and we got to make it bigger. And this is coming. And the fact that Google is going to push it and put out the software and put out the ideas, they're going to set a high bar because Microsoft wants to be like Google and Starbucks wants to be like that. And and everyone else is going to be saying, oh, well, Google did it. Why not you? And, you know, that's how it's going to work. So I'll first say that I'm, I'm very happy that the geniuses that Google employs have come up with these tools and are building it for, because that stuff will bleed out to everyone else. And that stuff will allow us as smaller people, as smaller businesses, as homeowners to up our game as well. So you know, Google's been pushing this for about two years and uh, I'm, it's, this is coming. This is coming. This is the next step. It's a good step. The, you're right though, the technology and the tracking, you know, I'm surprised that we, uh, you know what it is? Google can track it because Google gives, has a true department looking at it. Others can't track it because they don't have the tools and resources in house. We do have the ability to track these KWHs on a minute by minute basis uh we absolutely just, it's just not there yet we just got to keep working on it and make it easy and cost effective for everybody to do it um you know the reality is that as of yet we just doing the minimum to move forward they're signing the contract they're they're saying that they'll offset their energy they're paying an extra cent per kilowatt hour to buy those wrecks or whatever it is and you know and the energy is just getting dumped into the wholesale market and 
and that's how this is funded. So it's it's a start. We're progressing. Um, and yeah, I like this is progress. why this is why energy tag is important. I didn't know about energy tag. You know, this is and it just says very clearly this initiative has three main activities setting a standard for an hourly time stamped energy certificate and guidelines for a voluntary market coordination of demonstrator projects to showcase technology and kickstart market development and raising awareness of the importance of hourly accounting in energy this is a good example of disruption if if the established infrastructure isn't going to get on the train somebody else is just going to create it and the corporates will go there and they already have membership from major companies like Microsoft and uh, many, many energy companies. So uh, kudos to Energy Tag and, and I hope to bring him on the show here to talk about this. It's coming, it's coming. I mean, I think minute by minute, uh, blockchain tracked kilowatt hour generation and utilization will uh, will be the eventual game. Like every KWH that leaves the system will have some sort of uh, tag on it. And we'll know, we'll inject it into the system, we'll track it. Once, it you, once it's used, that token will be destroyed and we'll just have a rec record of it. As it. That'll come. You'll be able to sell electricity to your neighbor uh, soon enough. In certain markets, it can already sort of kind of happen, but it's coming. I, you know, I talked to... I know a guy in Texas, uh, Ilium, who's hoping to do that. And he's, he's already doing it for his own house with his own little coded system. It'll, it'll come. We'll get this hour by hour, minute by minute. And we'll, we'll be truly individually be able to say, hey, I have paid extra for clean KWHs and the tracking of them and the verification. Here's a document. What about you, bro? It's coming. Hey, I want to make a uh, request of our listeners. If you appreciate the Clean Power Hour content, please do us a favor. Go to cesnrg.com forward slash podcast, okay? And just click that red subscribe button. Subscribe to the channel. When you do that, it just takes you to the YouTube subscription page. And, you know, this is where we're bringing you really cutting edge information news on a weekly basis. Um, like the Meyer Burger Show, which is our most popular video to date. Um, and then, of course, all of the solar podcast interviews with folks like Bree Bruce from RPCS on wildlife and solar. But every week, me and John are here dropping a video every Friday with the latest energy transition news. So please subscribe to the channel and give us a thumbs up and give us comments. As John said, we love to hear from our listeners. You can do that through uh, Twitter through the you know through the website through the youtube there's so many ways to reach us you can also reach us on linkedin so we're not hard to find and then we are supporting the illinois solar energy association they are hosting a raffle for a tesla model x if you're interested in winning a tesla model x go to illinoissolar.org and click on the win a tesla link we've been raffling teslas for the last five plus years here the raffle Tickets cost $100 or four for $300. So for $400, uh, sorry, for $300, you can uh, you could win a Tesla. It's that simple. And in the in in the process, uh, do good things supporting the Illinois Solar Energy Association, which is our main education and advocacy organization here in the Midwest. Now back to the news. So. We can talk about solar panels, used solar panels traveling yes. the world. What's the story, John? So first off, solar panel recycling is a constant topic and it's being used by uh, uh, the fossil industry to put pressure and say, hey, solar panels are bad. It's, it's, and we do care about it, of course, in the solar industry because we want to be clean. But it's being used as a headline grabber at this point to uh, sow uh, what's it called? Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. FUD is their game. But the reality of used solar panels is that they don't go into landfills. They do not go, I'm going to repeat it. Solar panels that are used don't go into landfills, Tim. 
if they're still in any sort of working condition, there are many, many people that will buy your used solar panels and they will slowly collect them. They'll fill up a shipping container and then they'll move them around the planet. Um, I don't know if you remi- remember this, Tim, but we covered a story about a few months ago, sometime in the last year, in our 55, 56 uh, previous shows. We talked about used solar panels that were supposed to be thrown into a, um, were supposed to be recycled, but they were actually stolen by the mafia and taken to Africa and sold because they're useful. Because a solar panel with 80% output is a brand new solar panel with 100% of original output by whoever gets it. And what's, ha- what's shown here in this article is that over the last 10 years, we have chopped the number of people without electricity by about two thirds. It's gone from about 1.3, 1.4 billion down to less than 500 million. And while many of them have gotten their, while some of them have gotten their um, electricity from power lines, the majority of the people that have gained electricity over the last decade have done it via used solar panels being distributed around the world. And we need to say that really, really loud. Hey, Tim, used solar panels don't go into the garbage. They get reused, just like used cars do. And then they get used for 20 more years. And for people who only need two or three solar panels, they don't care that it's 80%. And um, energy poverty is real. And giving people just a little bit of electricity is not a trivial thing in the world. So I just, I think it's cool. Yeah, it's, it's amazing that there are a billion people that don't have electricity in the world and yeah. and if you can imagine l- living without electricity i encourage you to try it it's called camping uh for us in north america we we <laughs> we, we, we go on electric free vacations by going camping um and even then many of us still have electricity uh because let's face it we use electricity for everything running fans pumping water giving us lighting, cooking food now, et cetera, et cetera. And so I'm, uh, I'm completely on board with this. The other thing is that, you know, there are many bans on electronics going into landfills. Now here in Illinois, you can't, you can't just dump your used electronics in the trash. Uh, they have to be repurposed and recycled. And as we, as we've uh, reported several times on the show, there is this market for used solar panels. So when the when the modules are 25 years old, at the at and they can be replaced with better technology for an, a good ROI here in North America, they will go to Mexico, to Latin America, to Africa, to Asia, et cetera. There's no shortage of of uh, developing you know countries that really could use this technology. So. Yep. Um, I don't, I don't doubt that there's going to be a, a growing marketplace and organizations that are, you know, leveraging the flow uh, because it is today a river, tomorrow it's a torrent of used solar modules. And it's, it's a win-win. Hey, you know, I'll throw in an item on this old panel thing. You know, we didn't reference it on the show because we talked about recycling panels recently. But a uh, headline I saw over the past week uh, showed that a South Korean research facility was able to take, uh, they were able to recycle 100% of the glass. Aluminum is always 100% recyclable. So that's 80% of your solar panel recycled already. But they were also able to recycle the polysilicon in the panel. And they specifically took about 70 panels worth of poly and turned them back into solar cells again that had a 20% plus efficiency. So uh, we're either gonna take these used solar panels and give them to people who are gonna use them, or we're gonna make new solar panels. And because it's just too valuable. California will not allow you to throw solar panels away. You have to recycle them. It's a legal requirement. And so that's, that is just going to expand. And you know, it's good that we're getting pressure because it's good that we can punch them in the mouth and say, ah, you guys suck. Uh, we're better than you. We've been working harder than you, Mr. Oil and Fossil guys. We actually care. Give us the pressure. Swing at us. We'll take that punch. We'll return it. And uh, I love it. Push. Push us hard. We'll respond. 
All yeah. right, let's let's talk about uh, energy storage. Uh, and we have a story from Energy Storage News about FlexGen, where our friend Jan Brandt is the CFO, um, a investment firm called Apollo Global Management has invested $150 million in FlexGen, which is an energy storage system integrator. FlexGen got their start uh, in the microgrid space, working with the military, and now their their core business is uh, battery system storage integrator and software supplier to utilities and IPPs. Those are independent power producers, companies like Engie, for example, right? These are large energy companies that operate globally. And so this is just a, a part of a growing drumbeat of energy storage companies that are securing major investments. And we hope to bring Jan on the show here in the coming weeks to give us more details on how they're going to use this 150 million to clean the grid. That's pretty cool. I, uh, you know, the software surrounding energy storage is going to be big. Uh, for me, it's always, since I'm a small project guy, it's always been challenging to find small batteries that are cost competitive with good software. Uh, the best software is on smallish on the residential side where you have, uh, you know, Enphase and Solar Edge and uh, Tesla integrating into VPPs because they have these networks being run by Sunrun and and the middle space is still being skipped over. So I hope these folks do better um, and and keep growing. Hey, so can I uh, sneak in a story here that uh, you skipped over? I just want to show a quick image off Twitter because I like classic images. Yeah, what's that? It's that EV charging station network from 1916 in Chicago. Ah, yeah. I got this on screen now. A hundred years ago, Timothy. Electric car charging stations in Chicago. (laughs) That's all I got. hundred years ago, they had a 150 amp charging network in Chicago for EVs. Yeah. Yep. The EV is not a new invention, and uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, the ICE engine was just too too uh, too energy dense, I guess. And it has uh, been a disaster for humanity as much as it has been a boon for economic growth. Uh, if you think about taking out the ICE engine from the equation, we probably would not have runaway global warming the way we do right now. Great. Unintended consequences. That's why, that's why we have to be concerned about AI. And there are many potential unintended consequences from technologies like AI. N- narrow AI is great. It's a wonderful thing, right? You have a robot that builds cars so that cars can be uh, cost competitive and get into consumers hands and and drive the energy transition right electric electric vehicles uh are going to be made by robots and as we were talking in the pre-show tesla has launched or announced a a human a humanoid robot if you just google that we're not going to put that on screen but uh you know, and, and Elon is going out of his way to say, look, it's it's not it's going to be uh, a machine that a human could overpower and outrun. And but but, you know, I've seen the I've seen the videos of, of Atlas and other robots, right, that sh- clearly show that many of these robots are going to be able to overpower and outrun us yeah, and and outshoot us, et cetera. Right. So, um well, you know, the militaries of the world are weaponizing robots and we have to be very careful. It is a slippery slope. Absolutely. We're, we're every good thing we do, we use to kill human beings at some point and it's going to suck when it happens. And I wonder how we're going to defend against it. I wonder what we're going to do. Are we all going to have to have our own personal robots walking around with us with their own little laser weapons? Cause we know that laser, I know this sounds weirdo future, but we are literally developing laser weapon backpacks. And if a, ba- if a robot is already one half of a battery, all, we don't need to add a gun to it. We just give it a little fingertip that can shoot out a laser. And that's what's going to happen. 
and I don't know. Uh, I, I hope I hope I have passed from this planet or moved into space before uh, before we screw that one up because it is going to happen. And I just I hope we're smart enough, but I know we're always dumb because because we are. But we'll see. We'll see. Yep. So uh, let's go to wind power. You found a story about a new offshore turbine. The biggest, the coolest. <laughs> Sorry. Bigger, bigger <laughs> is better when it comes to offshore wind. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I will put this on screen here in a second. Min Yang, I hadn't heard that brand before. It's a, it's the leading Chinese manufacturer. Um, uh, I'm certain they've uh, uh, grabbed good data from other companies around the world. Um, it's the nature of, of um, Chinese technological growth. Uh, and grabbed means stolen, but such is it. I would, I, I don't know, whatever. Whatever, all that matters to me is that it's the next biggest, prettiest, warmest, and fuzziest. Um, well, what uh, makes it the biggest though, John? So there's two pieces. Well, the key one that matters is that it can fundamentally generate the most electricity from the smallest amount of space for a it's single It's 16 turbine. megawatts. That's, that's what yes. I'm looking for. 16 uh, megawatts. I think the biggest turbine previously was 14 megawatts. There, there has been a 15 megawatt announced and signed on to a project. Okay. The largest deployed in a test situation is 13. I don't know if it's been deployed widely in a 13 a megawatt facility i think only test facility for 13 but that's the biggest one that exists in the world that you can go touch right now uh but now a 16 meg that's going to be big and they're going to go bigger i've seen i mean we've seen designs of 50 megawatt wind turbines as hypothetical potentials so so this is just going to keep going and we're just going to keep you know every year i'm going to get to give you a new uh new tweet tim and it's going to say ha 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 Here's the newest, biggest, shiniest, and it's going to have some cool stats and everything. But, you know, 118 meter blade, that's the newest, biggest blade and uh, 16 megawatt unit. That's the biggest there. Um, you know, 80,000 megawatt hours per year. That's cool, man. That's just a lot of electricity coming. Uh, I remember seeing the stats on like the 13 through 15 megawatt ones, and they say one spinning of the turbine just one spin can power a house for a year and you know stats like that so these turbines are just awesome there and there is you know if we really wanted it to tim let's just say solar power didn't work on earth for whatever reason like polysilicon was just immensely expensive we could power the world with offshore so uh, wind easily easily and there yep. it there are offshore wind resources distributed around the world um, we could power the whole world with 3 million turbines in the North Atlantic Sea. I've, I've seen the research on it. It would, you know, obviously that's not going to work because we don't have global power lines yet, but we can do it with wind. And I, I love it. I like this offshore push. It's not going to stop. And I love that they keep finding bigger, shinier, prettier. Um, what I want to know is what is a hybrid drive? Do you know? <clears throat> They mentioned that several times in the story that the transmission in this is a hybrid. You know, in, in wind turbines, my understanding is you either have direct drive or other, but apparently there's also a hybrid. And I don't know what that is. And then the other, you know, the other news that's coming out about the wind industry is that the blades, for example, do use quite a bit of fossil fuels and in their manufacture. And this is a reason why we want to sip and not guzzle our fossil fuel resources. We need fossil fuels to make certain things. And eventually we will figure out a way to use direct air capture uh, and 3D printing, right? And just capture CO2 and convert that to these structures. But until that day, we, we need to sip the fossil fuels. And so, uh, and, and it, is a, it is a way of sequestering the, the fossil fuels in, in a more environmentally friendly way. I think I don't I don't I don't really know what the carbon footprint is of a wind turbine, but um, but anyway, I'm cognizant of this that we need to conserve our fossil fuel resources and 
and not put them all in the atmosphere in the form of air pollution. Perovskites, perovskites, Tim. Want to hear me Pro talk about perovskites? Perovskites? I always I want to talk about perovskites. Is that the LinkedIn story? No, no, no. That's the one right above it. We can do LinkedIn story next. LinkedIn story is cool too. Saltech? Saltech. That is the first official company, to my knowledge, that has an actual product in the world for commercial use of perovskites. And technically, this is their second time they've put it out in the world. The first one was just a little test, like a sign. But you see those window blinds on the right of that image you have there? Yeah. Those are perovskites. It's a very simple system. They move up and down. They track the sun to minimize heating and cooling and light. And that is a commercial installation of perovskite solar panels. And it might be the first. If their marketing is correct, that might be the first perovskite solar panel installation in the world. So in Lublin, Poland, on August 24th, Sol Technologies launched the first installation of photovoltaic blinds, sunbreakers, they're called, <laughs> with perovskite solar cells. And that's one of the good things about perovskites is they are translucent. And so you can both capture energy for electricity, but also allow energy to penetrate the building and give us daylighting, which is also a good thing. So it's, it's dual use of of solar energy basically i wonder what they cost i have just no idea i mean they probably are way more expensive than a standard installation because of the way they're installed because it's new and all kinds of stuff but hey it comes it comes eventually it'll come down i mean the perovskite material the manufacturing of it everything i read about says it's supposed to be much cheaper than how we currently make solar panels, uh, but they're going to have to they're going to have to work. They're going to have to scale. They're going to have to do a lot of work to get to that point where they can show off and say it for real. For now, it's for now it's in the talk talk stage, but it's it's there. It's no longer talk. Now it's beyond talk stage. Now there's something where I can say, "Oh, it's real. Go touch it." There's one of them, so it's sort of real, but it's coming. Yeah. Well, I think we should uh, we should end on that note and let our listeners know how they can reach the commercial solar guy because we want them to reach you, John. Smoke signals. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you could also do lasers into the sky, uh, similar to a bat signal sign. Uh, <laughs> Earth to John. Earth to yeah. John. <laughs> uh, CommercialSolarGuy.com. That's my website. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, all over. But, um, you know, reach out to us if you need consulting support, uh, as well if you are in Massachusetts and Rhode Island and you want a general contractor to build things. Uh, additionally, if you're uh, if you got some land in the Northeast, hey, look at that picture with my hat and the goofy looking face. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, commercial solar guy, just type it into Google and you will find us. And John has a great blog. If you go to his news page, uh, he's constantly giving us good uh, relevant industry information and reporting on technical reports so check out his blog if you haven't done that so what you, about can find, you, Tim? you can find me at cesenergy.com forward slash podcast and you can also find all of our content here from the clean power hour we're dropping a video a week on fridays we also are bringing you interviews with cutting edge manufacturers like Cubic PV and Meyer Berger. And we are working on an interview with Form Energy as well. So you can look forward to that. And then uh, my interview show, the solar podcast with thought leaders like RPCS and Bree Bruce, or, uh, you know, new research coming out of Penn State with Paulo Sores on irradiance tools for solar O&M. Uh, we bring you solar developers like UGE and Nick Blitterswijk, and then tools like Solar App, which is great for reducing the soft costs of solar. We had Becca Jones Albertus, who heads up the Solar Energy Technologies Office at the DOE. So check it out at cesenergy.com forward slash podcast. And please subscribe to the channel, give it a thumbs up, 
send us comments. It's the comments that are the most important thing, actually. Uh, that helps others discover the content. We need tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of new people to come into the energy transition. I don't care what you do. If, you could, if you're a finance geek, if you're a technician, if you're an engineer, if you're a sales guy like you and me, John, it doesn't matter. There's room for you in the energy transition and you are needed. So please uh, reach out to me if you want to get into the clean energy transition. I can help you find a job in solar, wind and storage. And with that, I'm going to say enjoy the rest of your trip, John. If, if anybody happens to be in uh, Montana, Kansas City, Indiana, uh, anywhere across the north, I'm going to stop in Minnesota specifically so I can get some cheese curds. Uh, and, uh, and Tim, I might come down and visit you in Champagne, Illinois. Well, if you're going to Indiana, which is my birth state, you have to go to Illinois because you really can't get to Indiana without going through Illinois. I mean, I could uh, avoid you, Tim, and cross into Canada and come all the way around because, <laughs> you know. I wouldn't put it past you. I wouldn't put it past you. <laughs> all right. Let's grow solar and storage. I'm Tim Montague. Have a great day, John.